Well, today we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, <clears throat> and the title of the message is Believable Believers. And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, somebody will say, well, you know, I'm a Christian, and you look at the way they live their life or their, the characteristics that define them, and you wonder, well, is that, is, you know, is, there, is that statement really believable? And Jesus said that we will be known by our fruits. And so what I want us to do today is look at this passage of Scripture in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And uh, Paul is giving us some characteristics uh, that should help to define a Christian. So 2 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 7. You then, my son, and Paul is writing to Timothy. He thought of him as a son in the faith. Uh, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses... In trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civ civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown, except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Now, Paul was using some very familiar sites to get Timothy's example and to use as object lessons. He spoke about soldiers, and the, uh, people at this time were very familiar uh, with the occupation forces of the Roman soldiers. Uh, they were very familiar with the uh, with, with the uh, Olympic Games, the Isthmian Games, and these other types of games that would uh, be held in coliseums and in, in various uh, places in the regions. And they were very familiar with the analogy or the symbolism of a farmer. And so Paul is using these as an example as to what the Christian should be. But there's a few other things in this passage of Scripture. To begin with, believers are believable due to their spiritual DNA. Now, on Friday, I did the funeral services for one of my good friends, uh, John Andrews, and uh, John had driven a truck, uh, an 18-wheeler, and had accumulated uh, three and a half million miles without ever having an accident or getting a ticket. And when I made that statement, I said, sadly, his daughter did not get that part of his DNA. And, uh, <clears throat> and everybody laughed because they, 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 they know Joni. But we have a spiritual DNA that helps define us as God's children. That's why Paul referred to Timothy as my son. Uh, it, when, he, when he wrote earlier, he referred to uh, Timothy's grandmother and mother who were people of faith, and he said, and I'm certain the same faith abides in you. And so we have something in common. We are heirs, according to Romans 8, 17. We are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. We have a family resistance if we live like a, the child of the king. Now, we're not born as a child of God, but everybody has the opportunity to become a child of God. In uh, 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 John chapter 1 and verse 12, <clears throat> it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. So the opportunity is there for people to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, here's something else. Believers are believable due to their unique strength. Paul said to Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He did not say, be strong and give me 10 push-ups. He didn't say, be strong and give me 10 pull-ups. Be strong and give me 10 set-ups. No, he said, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And that is a very unique type of, type of strength. And that's why Paul would tell the Philippians, I can do all things in Christ Jesus. Okay? That, that by, by the strength that we have in Jesus, we can do all things by his power, by his strength. It's the grace of God that is given to us. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace and nothing else, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, but by, for by grace are you saved how? Through faith. Faith in what? The shed blood of Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith and the, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. Then Paul goes on to say, For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And so that is the unique strength, is that we are God's workmanship, and he, he allows the Holy Spirit to work within us to energize us, to, to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our resolve, and to make us fit for his service. So we are, we are believable because of our unique strength. <clears throat> I, t I took a drink of water so I wouldn't cough. Now I'm choking on the water. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Believers are believable due to their investments. And notice in verse number two, Paul says to Timothy, <clears throat> the things which you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and so Timothy was Paul's uh, uh, was being mentored by Paul, and Paul would take him around when he would speak in other churches, when he would speak in other groups, and he says, Timothy, these are the things that you've heard me speak among many other witnesses, among many other believers. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, he says, now notice what he says, entrust them to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul is saying, Timothy, don't be like the Red Sea and let stuff flow in and not go anywhere. But he says, what you are learning from me, you are to pass it on to other people. Paul says, I, I have received it. I'm teaching it to you. You teach it to reliable people who can teach it to other people. And that's the idea of what we are supposed to be doing as Christians is investing in the lives of other people. Dawson Trotman. <clears throat> I never knew Dawson Trotman uh, but I, I read his material, and I felt like I, I almost knew him. He had a great love for people, and his ministry really began in working with sailors when they were in boot camp up in, up in Michigan. That's probably where you went, wasn't it, Harold? No. Where would you go to boot camp? Up, up. Great Lakes. The Great Lakes, okay, up, up in that area. Uh, uh, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it was, it was in, it was in, just agree with me, so it looks like I'm smart when people listen to the tape, okay? <clears throat> But it was, it was a, the Great Lakes part of Michigan, and then they would come into Chicago when they were on leave. But Dawson Trotman, and people called him Dawes, would begin to work with those, those sailors and lead them to Christ. And he wrote a little pamphlet called Born to Reproduce. And the idea, the thesis of the little pamphlet was that every Christian should reproduce himself or herself by sharing their faith and seeing somebody else come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Exactly what Paul had done with Timothy. He taught Timothy so Timothy could teach reliable men, so those reliable men could teach other people. It's what we see happening in John chapter 1. Uh, John tells us that uh, the first thing Andrew did, Jesus came to Andrew, and after Andrew, Andrew had this account, account uh, encounter with Jesus, John 1, 41 and 42, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon, and we know him now as Peter, and tell him we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. You go down to verse number 45, and we find Philip. Philip, we're told, found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. They made a unique investment of themselves in the life of somebody else that they might know Christ as their Savior. In 2 Corinthians 8, 1, uh, down through verse 5, Paul says, Now we make known to you, brothers and sisters, the grace of God given to the churches of Macedonia, that during a severe ordeal of suffering, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in the wealth of their generosity. For I testify, they gave according to their means and beyond their means. They did so voluntarily, begging us with great earnestness for the blessing and fellowship of helping the saints. And they did this not just as we had hoped. Now listen to it. But they gave themselves first to the Lord and to us by the will of God. The unique investment was they, had, they determined that they were going to invest their lives in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
giving of themselves to serve other people that they might come to know Christ as their Savior. Something else, believers are believable, believable due to their discipline. Notice in verse 3, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, now there's a couple of things about people in the military. They learn the discipline of obedience. Doing exactly what they've been told to exactly when they're supposed to do it. There was a certain way that we had to fold, fold our clothes. There was a certain place that that had to go in our foot locker. And then there was a certain way that our shirts had to be buttoned up. And if, when inspection time came, if it wasn't just so-so, you paid dearly for that mistake. But uh, uh, so we learn discipline. Notice what Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, 11. Part of that discipline involves us pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness, fighting the good fight of the faith, taking hold of the eternal life to which we've been called. Uh, and he says, if we do this in the sight of God who gives life to everything of Christ, uh, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you, keep this command. Paul says, as Christians, we are believable when we obey the commands of Jesus Christ. And to do that, we have to pursue what righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And we have to fight the good fight. Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one, uh, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall your love be made known. When people see us loving as Jesus loved, we become believable as believers. The soldier also learns the discipline of marching. You know, I'll never forget the cadence of those drill instructor, instructors walking along beside us. Left, 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 right, left, you know, and we had to step in unison and without fail, the guy named Gibson, his head would bob up when everybody else's was bobbing down and when we'd bob down, uh, his would go some other direction and we all suffered because Gibson did not know his right foot from his left foot. So they would take us to the steepest hill on base and double time us up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. And finally the drill sergeant said, when I come back in the morning, Gibson had better know his left foot from his right foot, you know. So, so we, we learned the discipline of marching, staying in step with Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 5. Paul says, follow God's example. He says, march in step with God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then in 1 Peter 2.21, he said, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Something else. Believers are believable due to their dedication. In verse number five of our text, Paul says, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So there's several things here. We have to play by the rules. We need to know our opponent and we need to have a goal. Now playing by the rules, Hebrews 12:1. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easy, easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance, here it is, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. In some of the races that you run, and I say you run because I haven't run one of them and I never intend to run one of them, I'll tell you. But you've got certain, certain places that you have check-in stations. I, I used to do those on my motorcycle, you know. We had to check in at a certain place. We'd ride in and we'd check in and we'd check into some other place to make sure that somebody wasn't taking a shortcut and cheating and not playing by the rules. So we become believable by our dedication to playing by the rules. I'd ought to send this part of it to Washington, D.C. <clears throat> the second thing is, you need to know your opponent. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 
You know, uh, I think it was Hal Lindsey who wrote a bo book years ago, Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. And, and uh, so we need to know our opponent. Uh, I used to uh, uh, coach uh, uh, Little League Baseball, and I used to help with the wrestling club and everything. And uh, when it was getting close to state, you know, I, I kind of had surveyed who, who my son's competition would be. And, uh, and so I took him aside, and I showed him a move, and I said, you cannot use this move unless I give you the okay. Because once you, once you use it, the other coaches will know you're going to have it, and you, it won't be effective. And so there was a certain way in the down position when this other kid got down on his opponent, he left himself very vulnerable. And I'd showed my son the way to clear him out with, the, with an elbow and, uh, and, and, and you could get a quick reversal. And my son, he looked at me and I gave him the nod and he did exactly what the way I'd trained him to do it because we knew the opponent. And if we're going to be effective, we need to realize that we have an opponent that we're wrestling against in this world. And that, uh, you know, uh, Peter said, Satan goes about, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom, whom he may devour. And we need to be aware of that. But we also need to have a goal. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize, and that's the goal? Run in such a way as to get the prize. I mean, why in the world would you enter a race unless you thought you could win the prize? Unless you were going to try to get it. Uh, Dan, uh, I think his name is Dan Crenshaw. He's the legislator that's got the eye patch. I don't know if you've seen him on TV or not. And uh, uh, he, he was a Navy SEAL. But he said one of the things that differentiated the guys that made it, that went through that grueling week of, of, uh, of uh, 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 boot camp times about a thousand, uh, it was so rigid and so horribly tough. He said the ones that actually make it and the ones that drop out and have to ring the bell signifying they're quit is the ones who make it do not have a plan B. They don't have a plan B to fall back on. The ones who make it have a plan A, and that is the aim that I'm going to finish this course at all costs. Crenshaw actually broke his leg the first time he went through and had to drop out, have surgery, and came back and went through all that a second time before he became a SEAL. But we have to compete to get the prize. Notice what Paul says. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. You know, what we, what we are striving for is to live a life that is so pleasing to Jesus Christ that when we get to heaven, there'll be a crown or a reward for us. Paul says, therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating there. He says, I'm not just into shadow boxing. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul says, I beat my body into subjection, basically he's saying, I have a workout regimen that I follow every day. I think I read one time that, that people who would compete in these big uh, stadiums had to check in like 10 months to a year ahead of time and show that what their training schedule would be because they only wanted the best of the best in these in these marathons and in these in the Ismanian games and what we would call the Olympic games and so we have to have a goal here's something else believers are believable due to their devotion Paul said the hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops Paul says it's just logic. If he's going to sow it, if he's going to plant it, if he's going to water it, if he's going to harvest it, he ought to get the first cut of the fruits of his labor. And he, and he says we need to be devoted. I mean, the, the farmers and ranchers have to be self-motivated because a lot of them are working their own ground. There's nobody looking over their, their, their shoulder saying get up, get after it. But most of them are up when the sun's up or even before and out working even after the sun goes down. And so we need to be devoted. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 5 through 9. See, there had been a debate going on at the Corinthian church. People were bragging, you know, I got baptized by Apollos. 
And somebody would say, well, I had been baptized by Stephen before he was martyred. And somebody else would say, well, I got baptized by Peter. And here's what Paul says. What is Apollos really? Or what is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe and each of us in the ministry of the Lord uh, gave us. I planted, he's saying, I sowed the seed. Apollos came along and he watered it by his teaching, but God caused it to grow. So neither the one who plants counts for anything nor the one who waters, but God who causes the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters work as one, but each will receive his reward according to his work. We are co-workers belonging to God. You are God's field and you are God's building. But Paul says we needed to be devoted to the harvest that God is placing before us and being faithful to work the harvest. In Matthew chapter 9, uh, verses 35 through about 38, it tells us that Jesus was going through the villages and the synagogues teaching and preaching. And he says when he saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion because he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. And he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his fields. And we, folks, are the answer to our own prayers. Because when we pray for workers in God's harvest, we need to be out there laboring, we being co-laborers with Christ. Believers are believable due to their insight. In verse number 7, Paul said, Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Now let me read it for you out of the Amplified Version. Think over the things I'm saying. Grasp their application for the Lord will grant you insight and understanding in everything. Solomon stated that I did this way. He says, then I scrutinized it. I was putting my mind to it. I saw I took a lesson. Notice four things Solomon said. This is how we build our insight into the words of God. You scrutinize it. You read it. You scrutinize it. You make sure you're putting it in your mind, and then you see what God is teaching, and then you take that lesson. You learn it, and you share it with others. Joshua stated it this way. God said, Joshua, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the the law that my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right nor to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your mind. And here it is, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Meditate on it day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. It's because we have an insight into the Christian worldview, the world, the way that God views it, the way he wants us to use it, We have a keen insight into the principles of God's word, and we are believable when we do not just talk about those things, but we live them in the way that we live our lives. Psalm 1 says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, what does he do? He meditates on it day and night. And he will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. And whatever he does will prosper. When I was thinking about our keen insight, I thought about some of the statements in Psalm 119. I'm going to give you three of them. Psalm 119, 73, 125, and 144. The psalmist said, your hands made me and fashioned me. And then here's his prayer. Give me understanding that I might learn your commandments. Then in verse 125, he said, I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. And then in verse 144, your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. Well, may we have that keen insight and may we understand that the soldier is in submission to his superior and he's encouraged by the thought of a final victory. The athlete is in submission to his trainer and encouraged by the vision of a crown. The father is in submission to the elements of mother nature and he's encouraged by the hope of the harvest. We ought to be encouraged that God is saying, you have not chosen me, 
but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you should ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. May God give us understanding of that and realize that we are believable believers when we live the life that God has called us to live. Well, Father, as we come now, I want to thank you, Lord, for our time together here today. I'm thankful, Father, that you've told us that people know us by the fruit that we bear. And I'm thankful, Father, that this book of 2 Timothy allows us to see the characteristics that Paul has set forth that allows us to be believable believers. And may we live a life, Father, that people can see Christ in us. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as we get...